Uh, my name is Raminta Moore. I am the arts and culture librarian here. Uh, I tend to do events like this, Noonday Concert Series. Uh, and before we begin, before I introduce folks, uh, I'd like to do a very quick land acknowledgement. Acknowledgement is a simple way of showing respect and a step towards correcting the stories and practices that erase indigenous people's history and culture and toward inviting and honoring the truth. Portland Public Library would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather today is the occupied and unceded territory of the Wabanaki, the people of the place where the sun first looks our way, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. So to, for tonight's discussion, I would like to introduce Brendan Barnes, who is a PPL staff member, writer, MFA, uh, and Ilion Wu. Brendan is a writer and culture critic from Central Florida who came to Maine in 2016 and to Portland Public Library in January of this year. His fiction has been published in the Portland Review and Bayou Magazine. After earning his MFA, he started an online magazine called Sinkhole with his grad school buddies that still hosts archives of his cultural criticism, reviews, and interviews with writers like Annie Hartnett and David Vaughn. Ilion Wu is the New York Times bestselling author of Master Slave Husband Wife, an epic journey from slavery to freedom and The Great Divorce, a 19th century mother's extraordinary fight against her husband, the Shakers, and her times. Her writing has appeared in the Boston Globe, the Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine, and the New York Times. And she has received support for her research from the Whiting Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities and the American Antiquarian Society, among other institutions. She holds a BA in the Humanities from Yale College and a PhD in English from Columbia University. This event is also brought in partnership with Back Cove Books. Thank you for coming. So if y'all would like to come out, we'd love to hear about Master Slave, Husband, Wife. Thank you very much. You hear me? All right. Live as well? We're good? Excellent. Thank you all for coming. Professor, thank you so much for being here with us. Really appreciate it. Um, I don't know. What, what, would you like to start with just a selection from the beginning of, of your book? Sure. Um, well, first of all, it's really wonderful to be here. Um, I'm so glad to be in conversation with you, Brendan, today. And please call me Ilian. And um, gosh, on the way over here, I walked by, we were just talking about this, the, um, it's now the Bow Bow Dumpling House, but it's actually where the crafts were hidden here in Portland, Maine. So this was like, this was their last stop before leaving the United States, and it was an unexpected stop for them to be there. So the history feels so alive and present here, and it's just, um, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here tonight. And I guess I will begin with a short reading from the beginning of the book, not the very opening, which is sort of like a, a big overture, but from a, with a quiet moment when the crafts are first leaving Macon. So maybe I'll situate this a little bit. William and Ellen Craft were an enslaved couple from Macon, Georgia. She was a seamstress and dressmaker. He was a cabinet maker, and you can still see some of the beautiful handiwork that he's, he's left behind. And they disguised themselves as master and slave even though they were actually husband and wife. And they did this with Ellen, who was very light complected, pretending to be a rich white male enslaver and William pretending to be her slave. So she's crossing lines of gender, class, ability, and race to go on this extraordinary journey. So this, we will enter with them, uh, we will join them in the cottage 
as they are getting ready to leave Macon. The Cottage. It is pre-dawn in Macon, Georgia, and at four o'clock, the city does not move. The air is windless, chill, barely stirring the high, dark pines. Cotton Avenue is quiet, too, the giant weighing scale suspended for the moment behind closed warehouse doors. But the Okmulgee River flows along the eastern shore, and so, too, an enslaved couple moves, ready to transform in a cabin in the shadow of a tall, white mansion. They have scarcely slept these past few nights as they rehearse the moves they now perform. Ellen removes her gown, forgoing a corset for once, though she needs to reshape her body in other ways, flatten or bind the swell of her breasts. She pulls on a white shirt with a long vest and loose coat, slim-legged pants, and a handsome cloak to cover it all. She does up the buttons, breathing in the late December cold. Christmas is coming soon. She dresses by candlelight, which flickers through the cottage, her workshop locked with a key, the least of which she'll lose if she's caught. All around are the tools of her trade, work baskets stocked with needles and thread, pins, scissors, cloth. Her husband's handiwork is in evidence as well, wood furniture, including a chest of drawers now unlocked. Ellen slips her feet into gentlemen's boots, thick-soled and solid. Though she has practiced, they must feel strange, an inch of leaden weight pulling each sole to the ground, an extra inch she needs. Ellen may have inherited her father's pale complexion, but not his height. Even for a woman, she's small. William towers beside her, casting long shadows as he moves. They must do something with her hair, which she has just cut, gather it up, pack it. To leave it behind would be to leave a clue for whoever eventually storms down the door. There are the final touches, a silky black cravat, also the bandages. Ellen wears one around her chin, another around her hand, which she props in a sling. She has more protection for her face, green tinted glasses and an extra tall silk hat, a double story hat, William calls it, befitting how high it rises and the fiction it covers. These additions hide her smoothness, her fear, her scars. Ellen stands now at the center of the floor, transformed. To all appearances, she is a sick, rich, white, young man, a most respectable-looking gentleman, in her husband's words. He is ready, too, in his usual pants and shirt, with only one new item, a white second-hand beaver hat, nicer than anything he has worn before, the marker of a rich man's slave. To think it had been a matter of days, four days since they had agreed to the idea, first called it possible, four days of stuffing clothing into locked compartments, sewing, shopping, mapping their way, four days they would claim to prepare for the run of a lifetime, or a lifetime of preparation narrowed down to this. William blows out the light. They kneel and pray in the sudden dark. They stand and wait breath held. Is that someone listening, watching outside? Just beyond their door is the back of the Collins house, where master and mistress should be asleep in bed. The young couple, holding hands, step to the front of the cottage as gently as they can. William unlocks the door, pushes it open, peers out. There's just the circle of trees, a whispering of leaves. Such stillness, he thinks of death. Nevertheless, he gives the sign to go. Or it can be so kind of harrowing to, to read and experience thinking about the all of the elements of, of, of that escape and that journey. And I want to return um well to the elements because that chapter is so much about the transformation and about the costume um and you spend time pointing out each of the components of of their costume for william it's primarily the hat which does become relevant later in the story because as you describe it's 
you know, the hat that you'd wear if you were a slave of an especially well-to-do person. And, and, you know, it draws the ire of people who are like, why does this slave have a finer hat than I have, white people who they encounter on, on the journey. Um, so I, I, I want to talk more about, you know, the transformation and, and, the, and the clothing, but maybe first, can we talk about how and when this story started to reveal itself to you, what the beginning of, of that research journey was like for you? Yeah, so I, well, we both went to Columbia University. We were just talking about that. So we were both in New York, yes, but you were, you were a youngin, so you were there before, after I was. Um, and it was at Columbia. Did you take a class with Robert O'Mealy? So he taught jazz and all kinds of things. I mean, he really just, uh, I mean, he wrote about music, he wrote about literature, all kinds of things. Anyhow, he taught a class on the literature of passing. So it's that class that, and him, he's the one who introduced me to this text. And I just remember, I mean, it's funny because the narrative that introduced me the craft, to, to the crafts, it doesn't actually begin with the start of their escape. It begins with, the, you know, there's a preface and there's sort of all this explanation. And um, the, this scene really comes much later. But when I think back to the moment that really kind of gripped me. It's the description that the crafts give themselves in their 1860 narrative, Running a Thousand Miles to Freedom, when they are describing the moment uh, in the cabin when they're getting ready, when they're describing how William is like cutting her hair, which is a real point of no return, and Ellen putting on these elements of the costume. But actually the costume stuff, so that's one, one of the things I wanted to do in writing this book is the crafts themselves have a really great page turning narrative. It's very short, it's 60 pages, but they describe the journey in a way that like put me at the edge of my seat. It's part of what, you know, what really drew me in. But there's a lot that I didn't, that, that, that the text doesn't answer. So that's for a couple reasons. One of the biggest reasons why is that Ellen Craft's mother was still enslaved by the people who had originally held Ellen in bondage. So Ellen was the daughter of James Smith and a woman that he enslaved named Maria. And when they opened their narrative, actually getting back to the opening of the 1860 narrative, they say in William's voice, because the whole thing is delivered in William's voice, they say, my wife's first master was her father and her mother his slave. And they note that her mother is still enslaved by her father's widow because the, the father has died by this time. And it's actually the widow who separates Ellen from her mother. So Ellen bore such a striking physical resemblance to her biological father that his legal wife was just, um, they use the words annoyed in, in, the, in the original text by the sight of her. And she couldn't stand it when people thought that Ellen was a legitimate child of the family. And so when Ellen is 11 years old, she, she gives away Ellen as a wedding present to her own daughter. So Ellen becomes the slave of her biological half-sister. Yeah. Um, so I think I've gone on a big old tangent here, but that's sort of the, the, the background, the context to... Um, yeah. As you were kind of uh, pulling other threads of it together, what were you in, encountering that, um, that you knew was going to be the details on the other sides of that story, outside of the escape that is, you know, the bulk of their original narrative. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So, yes, you've brought me back on track again. I'm sure this railroad metaphor is just going to keep coming back. You can't help Good. that well, and the crafting, right? <laughs> we'll get to the craft of it later. But so, yes, the crafts have this rollicking 1860 narrative, and they have sort of the basic laid out. So they do introduce Ellen's enslaver and his wife and her mother. 
But there are so many questions that they can, and there's so many matters they can't go into in too much detail because Ellen's mother is still hostage, um, in bondage. So there, there are many unanswered questions. And I really wanted to know two things, really. One is what was their life like in bondage before their escape? So their escape is this high wire act, and that is, super fraught and super exciting, but if we don't know what is on either side of that tightrope, both the before and the after, and what lies underneath, what they could possibly fall into, then we don't fully appreciate the magnitude, I think, of their heroism. So one of the things I wanted to do was really try to figure out why did they have to escape so quickly? They put this plan together in four days. What was driving them? Was there something, a particular catalyst that, that that was motivating to, to them to flee as they did. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to do is entirely sort of the opposite, is that I wanted to get into the mundane, the nitty gritty of like, okay, what did she actually put on her body? What did it feel like to move in these clothes? What did it feel like to move on the train? Like, what did it smell like and taste like? Taste like, And what was the texture, the feeling of those times to bring that world alive so that it doesn't just become, you know, a cartoon, a caricature of people moving in space, um, not just an action-adventure movie, but something bigger and more profound. Of sense, and thank you for explaining. Um, the first third of this book that really details the escape is a true high wire act. I mean, we have you know the, the chapters are especially short in that stretch, and it's moment to moment. And truly, in each chapter, it feels there's a moment where it could all easily fall apart. Being perhaps recognized by someone who knows them, things like you know, just tension around the clothes that you're wearing and the way that the costume kind of fits into that um, with, you know, the, the sling and the poultices that, um, that Ellen wears. All of these things are so deliberate, right, to, to make, uh, to help kind of sidestep a lot of these potential traps that, that they could encounter, you know, with the poultice, for example, pretending, you know, rheumatism or a toothache, that means you can probably, hopefully, get away with a lot less talking. Because every time you open your mouth, there's a tremendous risk of someone discovering too much about you. Um, and, and inadvertently, like, because one other thing, so I went just completely obsessive in all the details, like the clothing details, the period details. And one of the things I looked up was, like, what did this poultice actually is there a recipe for these poultices? And yes, there was. There's like a 19th century, you know, there are these health books that actually tell you how to put these things together, what goes in them. And I was curious because they're described in the 1860 narrative as smelling really bad. So that actually helped them too, because they're in this steamship. Uh, I learned, this is another, like, so I researched a steamship, and it turned out it's not like one of these big, grandiose things that look like wedding cakes. These are really claustrophobic quarters. So if you have somebody who smells bad, that's a real problem. Like, you're, like, locked into that space with them, and you're in the water. So William's heating up these poultices to, to put on Ellen, and people are just commenting on how bad that smells. So, of course, I was like, All right, what is making this smell so bad? And it's ammonia. That's, a, that's the main bad-smelling ingredient there. But you could, you know, I have, I think, probably in my footnotes a, uh, a you know, reference to a book. So if you want to make a poultice yourself, you can find that book and, and look it up. <laughs> you, too, can smell like Ellen Craig. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Yeah, it's it's and ward away it's, evil because well, that's really yeah, what they were doing. Yeah, ward away excess conversation. And yes, then, you know, real self-selecting kind of thing. If you smell like a <laughs> might engage you in friendly conversation. <laughs> Although it didn't stop, um, one of my other favorite scenes. Uh, uh, I mean. As you said, it, it, like there, every single moment, I mean, I knew it was going to happen, but I was like, how are they going to get out of this one? But despite the stinkiness of the poultices, there's one point at which there are these young ladies who are so enchanted by Ellen's lovely conversation, because it really had to be that. Um, her suit was ill-fitting, as I learned. Uh, her, she had the stinky poultices, and yet she was able to make conversation in such a way that they were like, 
But um, at least one of the daughters was like developing what appeared to be a pretty strong crush on <laughs> on Ellen. And, <laughs> and and the narrative it's actually really funny because there's a little there you know they're describing this happening that Ellen Ellen says they fell in love with the wrong chap. <laughs> and and even those moments of levity, I think it circles back later, maybe just as kind of a a, a passing thought as they're reflecting on elements of risk in New England after they've uh, kind of made their fundamental escape, at least past the, the Mason-Dixon line. But there's that moment of a little bit of fear around the transgression of the, the gender, um, the, the, the gender transition that Ellen has made of pretending to be male. There are so many moments where in, in the narrative, it seems like they, one of the most fearful, the things that they're most afraid of is actually the pretending to be male and situations like that because they anticipate really harsh consequences for things like, um, you know, seducing a young uh, woman under false pretenses. And so there's all of these layers of, of concern and, and risk. And, you know, before you open the book, you kind of just assume a one basic fundamental layer of risk. But what your narrative really does uh, quite beautifully is to weave in all of these other layers of the transformations that they had to make and the risks that came with each of those transformations. Thank you. I mean, you put your finger right on it. I mean, it's part of what moved me so deeply in reading their original narrative. And it's what I really did try to carry through in the book, which is that those moments of irony and humor are right up against horrible potential pain or suffering and risk. And that happens in the journey. And it happens also, as you say, after. Because on the one hand, so we can talk about the fact that the crafts are, go on this abolitionist lecture circuit. So even if they've made the thousand mile journey to Philadelphia. I don't think it's giving it away because this book is all about the how and not the what. Um, it's about how they fe face each of these hurdles in these impossible ways. So they, they do eventually make it to Philadelphia. And then you would think at that point you would just go undercover, you lay low, you uh, change your name maybe, and you start raising a family. That was their original dream. But no, uh, the abolitionist activists who sort of descend on them, surround them once they arrive in the north, they know this is an incredible story. So one of them, my, one of my favorite characters, I, I wonder what you think about him actually, William Wells Brown, is he comes and he says, you must tell your story, join me. And they do, they join him for like another thousand miles on this crazy, you know, lecture circuit experience, and that's where, so William Wells Brown himself is a self-emancipated man, a best-selling author. Um, he can move crowds of like thousands of people. It said that at one point there wasn't a single dry eye in a room with like 7,000 people or something. So he's an incredible storyteller, incredibly charismatic, and he's, you know, they're in Boston, they're on this huge stage, and he's telling this like really kind of titillating story about Ellen being on the train and having this young woman like fall and you know get all uh, you know flustered and flustered smitten. yeah uh, smitten by uh, by Ellen and meanwhile her dad is like let me help you take off your boots so she puts her leg up and he's like taking her I mean that is like scandalous stuff for the 19th century so on the one hand people are inevitably laughing and it's interesting but that same laughter could turn on a dime because for Ellen Craft to have done those things is so transgressive. She's crossing, again, lines of class and gender and race um, and ability, all of these things. And so the crowd that is, on the one hand, super entertained could also suddenly say, hey, what kind of person are we dealing with here? So she has to go from per performing the role of the perfect man to being really the perfect woman. I mean, talk about a tightrope. She had to walk a line so fine. I mean, I, it's just ah, um, like breathtaking. Yes, it's incredible. And I found myself so fascinated with Ellen as a character in the story because I think I like, perhaps maybe for different reasons because of who I am and my, 
the context of the passage of time, Ellen, in the context of the story, really does become a kind of celebrity. And what I would love to talk with you about is um, some of that difference between Ellen's celebrity compared to that of the Williams, both of them, you know, um, because they're both self-emancipated black men. And in all of these, um, when they're doing their lecture tours, everyone is very charmed and very impressed with both of the Williams and William Craft reveals himself to be eventually a really great storyteller and people become big fans of, of what he is bringing to the stage. But there's a very different level of reverence and all of these other qualities that people bring to their kind of, it's kind of like a precursor to like a parasocial relationship in my mind, the way that they're so fascinated with Ellen. I think it's partly because these white audiences can more easily put themselves in the shoes of Ellen Craft. Like to look at her, you know, they can't understand how she isn't them and vice versa. They're looking at a person who appears to be white, but clearly is choosing to be black, making the, the choice to take on, you know, the, the, the label that she's carried all of her life because of where she lived and, and um, the institution of slavery. And I, I think that might have something to do with, with that different type of celebrity, but I'm, I want to hear what, what your thoughts are on that. I mean, definitely they have, they play very, very different roles and they, they treat their performance completely differently. And I was thinking about this too, I was, as I was driving up from Boston um, and passing some of the places where they spoke, because uh, they really kind of zigzagged all over New England. And one of the, one of the major, I mean, the one place where we know that Ellen Craft told her story was in Newburyport, which is the birthplace um, home of William Lloyd Garrison, where William Wells Brown had lectured before. And we know because there is a blacksmith's account uh, uh, that, that she actually told her s story there. I wish that somebody had transcribed that speech. You know, it's one of those things where you're like, he's talking about how nice it is to see William Wells Brown. I'm like, can we shift the camera a little bit, please? You know, <laughs> I look for his diary. I thought maybe he just, you know, he wrote about her or something in his diary. He does have a diary, but he does not say anything about her. Um, but fortunately, he did even leave that little bit of a tantalizing record. But what I found is that, so she speaks there in front of 900 people, and she captivates them, and then she goes silent. So I have a number of different theories about this in which in, that I describe in my book. And her storytelling presence and her methods evolve both here and in the UK. But she definitely fascinated me. Uh, she never stopped playing a role on stage, but that, 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 that performance became much more sort of interior. And actually it reflected, um, in many ways it reflect, it, it was kind of a continuation of the performance that she did on that thousand mi initial thousand miles. Yeah, I don't know if I'm being too obscure here, but. No, but I, you, know, you make a good point, even if it is maybe a, a touch obscure, but I think that it makes, it, it for me, if I haven't read this book yet, that would be one of the things that I would be most tantalized by is kind of the mystery of Ellen's interior uh, approach and, and the evolution of it. You're right. The way that she participates in the lecture circuit um, in Philadelphia and in New England, how it changes over the course of, of her journey. There's, in some ways, it's almost a, a blessing for the story as an invitation to the reader to participate, to kind of wonder what would I, how would I have approached that? Why would I let my partner do the speaking? I'm sure that can't say I'm sure, but that the gender roles and the pressure of, you know, all these very traditional types of thinking about what men and women could do, even as entertainers, may have been a factor at times, but ultimately, yeah, it is a, a very interesting mystery that, you know, I, I hope that you'll all engage with yourselves when you when you read the book. About this too is that so they make this escape around Christmas of 1848. 
And it's within a couple weeks that William Wells Brown is dancing into their lives and saying, come join us. They are physically not well. They've had a lifetime of trauma in bondage. And then they're in front of like hundreds or thousands of people and they're being asked to rehearse that trauma, to tell their story. People are asking them all kinds of really probing, intensely personal questions. To imagine them doing this night after night, I mean, it's really nonstop, traveling nonstop. It's just unbelievable. And, you know, there's been a variety of scholarship on sort of why Ellen Craft starts stop speaking. And some of the early scholarship suggested that she was silenced by the two Williams. But what, everything I see of, of Ellen Craft, she's the woman who made her own choices. Nobody was going to silence her. You have her saying later, and one of the, my favorite lines that she slings at some British person who's you know, t t talking nonsense at a dinner table much later on is they say, well, you know, can the slaves really take care of themselves? And she says, considering that until, you know, that they're taking care of both themselves and everybody else, I would think that they would be able to take care of themselves just fine, you know? So she can, like, she, she's got lots of zingers. She knows how to speak very sharply when she wants to. I don't think she was a lady who was out there to be, she, she was not being silenced. I think she was doing the driving. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me turn to a part of that, I think it was William Wells Brown was talking about in Salem while they're doing this lecture circuit. And he said something about, you know, if I could tell you the truth of slavery, I would rather do it one person at a time and whisper it in your ear. Um, and that the truth of it is that it's never been represented, and that it never could be represented. And that, that line jump kicked me, and I'm still reeling from it. And I... I was going to open the book with that, actually. I thought it might be too confusing in the end. But he does. He said, this is, so there, he's lecturing. This is not when he's with them, but he says, because he's being asked to, to lecture about, people are saying, this lady's abolitionist society is saying, tell us about slavery as it is, you know? And there's, you know, there's genuine interest and care, but there's also this kind of, voyeuristic element too. So he has to walk that line. They all have to walk that line. And he, and he says to them, the truth is, you know, if I were to really tell you about the deepest degradations of slavery, I would have to, I would take you one at a time and whisper it in your ear. And he says, slavery has never been represented. Slavery can never be represented. And I actually, I took that quote and I, and I had it on my bulletin board as like the first thing that I would see uh, every day in my study as a reminder that no matter how hard we try to approximate, there is no getting to that reality. So it's a, it's a humbling reminder from an incredible man. As you were, what is it feel like to as it relates to this particular narrative to try to represent some of, of, of that story. I mean, to me, it, it's peculiar, but even now it still feels like a somewhat radical act to try to accurately represent even just a sliver of, of, uh, of the, the institution itself, you know? Representing the unrepresentable, I mean, uh, unrepresentable and the unrepresented is, uh, um, it's an impossible task, but I, it's one that I, um, I guess I tried, how did I approach this? I read as much as I could of firsthand narratives. I tried to understand the places and spaces in which this was happening. Sometimes it was a matter of finding um, of juxtaposition. So, for example, when the crafts go to Charleston and there's a big confrontation at the custom house there, 
again, to use that camera metaphor, uh, I sort of pan over from the custom house to the side of it where I learned that the largest outdoor in, um, sales of enslaved people in Charleston were happening right there. So the crafts are walking right past that when they go into this building. So they're walking past these sales, which are also kind of, they must spark memories of the incredible um, trauma that they faced as children being separated from their family members, not to mention just the possibility that that could be them at any moment. They get, they, they get caught there and they will go to this terrible jail, which I also learned about, that it's called the Sugar House in Charleston. So I draw that in too, and I draw in Ellen's memory of this place, because one of the things that I discovered is that this was not her first time in this town. So I, I try to draw in all those spaces to sort of to the, evoke the fullness of their experiences. Um, yeah. Because my editor was like, this book is too long. <laughs> no, oh my but gosh, but you know how big this was originally? I mean, thank goodness, it's not, I'm, I'm glad you say it's not too long, but there was a point where um, my, my, oh my gosh. Yeah, so I knew, I think I had a couple hundred pages, and they hadn't even made it to, like, Philadelphia. You know, it was really bad. And so I saw my editor, and I was like, um, you know, how, how, long, how long can this be? And she's like, 350. And I, was, and, and I guess I looked a little scared. And she said, 400 tops. And then I'm still thinking, I'm like, organize your face, like, change your expression, do something. <laughs> And, uh, she, and then, and this is the worst part of it, she was like, and I saw her and I told her this um, recently, and she was like, I didn't know I was so scary, but she said, she's like, when I, when I, I was like scarred at the idea of 400, she's like, oh, you need me to cut? And then she gets this like, you know, like Sweeney Todd kind of look in her eye, and she's like, because I can cut. And I was like, oh my gosh, no. <laughs> like, let me murder my own darlings. Um, so I literally kept, I kept a whole document that was like a calorie counting sheet of words for like how many words I could have per chapter, per section. So there was so much that actually didn't make it in here. Um, the fear of that, that, that murderous, uh, you know, slashing. And actually, this is another like funny aside, but, uh, uh I, when I was with my editor and her friend, and she said her, the friend was saying, oh yeah, she was doing the edit, her editing on the beach. And I was wondering what she was doing, because she was like, like making this like gesture with her hand. And I looked down and she's like slashed, like page after page after page. So that was me. Um, but just to give one example, actually we could talk about Portland, because the crafts come through, as I mentioned earlier, they come to Portland and at the site of the Bao Bao Dumpling House, which I hope has good dumplings. I think you said they do have good dumplings, right? So at 133 uh, Spring Street, um, there was a couple called Lydia and Oliver Dennett. So they operated sort of this underground railroad station. The crafts were not supposed to stop there. They were, sp I mean, they were supposed to just let, like, sail on through Portland, but if there was, so there's that original journey out of Macon, and that one, it's just like miraculous how they managed to make different things. The journey out of America, like everything goes wrong, and one of the things that goes wrong is they come to Portland and their ship is broken, the ship that they're supposed to be taking, and this happens all the time, right? But they're stuck here, and so they have to go to the Baobao Dumpling House site, um, and 
it's Lydia and Oliver Dennett who are there. And when I started researching them, I was like, these people are so interesting, especially her. So she was a, she was a women's rights activist. Um, she was a suffragette. She uh, hid all these people in her house. They kept a span of horses at the ready for, for incidents like this um, to help people. And in fact, there had been we haven't really talked about how dangerous the abolitionist lecturing was, but it was definitely a fraught journey because it's not like all New Englanders were like, hey, like we're, we're open to this, it's a great idea, yeah. Um, there were a lot of people who were really opposed, and even here in Portland, there was, an, uh, there was a powerful uh, abolitionist coalition, but then there were also people who were angry enough about this issue that there was a riot at a church where a, um, an, an abolitionist lecturer, um, Stephen Foster, was speaking. I don't know if you know Abby Kelly Foster and Stephen Foster, but they're, they're a, another husband and wife duo um, who spoke with the crafts. They spoke here. Anyway, Stephen Foster was lecturing at this church, and this riot broke out to the point that he had to climb out a window of the church. And guess who's with him? Lydia Dennett is there with another friend, and these two ladies jump out like the church with him. They're on either side. He's getting his like coat ripped and everything like that. They accompany him uh, to a house next door, and then she takes him to her own house, and that's where he rests and he heals. So these are the kind of heroes that, I mean, so I did have a version of this where, you know, all this church action was happening, but there just isn't, there wasn't enough room. And so I did, one of the things that I tried to do was really show not just the crafts in isolation, but all these people around them, the world around them, and the village, the community that supported them. And so one thing that you'll see if you open the book, these are some of the people that you'll meet along the way. The Dennett's are not here. I did look for their images, but, but they're people like the Dennett's who stood with the crafts, a multiracial army of people, and they're they're here, they're in the footnotes. So in the cases like the Dennett's where uh, they ended up on the cutting room floor, they live in the footnotes. So, ho so hopefully somebody else can, can find them. And you're right. It's, you know, we, we've talked a bit about the harrowing first third of getting from Macon to Philadelphia, but this truly is a story about always kind of exchanging one risk for a different risk, exchanging one danger for a different type of danger. And with it, as, you know, up until the point of basically at which they get to Portland, there's always a growing community of people around them that kind of helps shoulder the burden of some of that increased risk. But you're right, it is very much a, a journey of out of a frying pan into a fire, into a frying pan, into a fire again into a boat and the boat breaks, you know, and it's, it's very much um, that, that kind of story. Um, but there are tons of fun people, huh? Yes. Like, I mean, I mentioned William Wells Brown, who I love. Did you have a favorite secondary character? Oh, gosh, let's see. Um, well, I was, I was really charmed by the carriage driver that we meet. Is that an escape? Daniel Bowditch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, by by him, and I think that he was one who hadn't um, really used a pistol before. Yeah. But when <laughs> but when the moment came that he had to help with an escape, he had it with him, and he was ready for action. And yeah, I have I, I really like William Wells Brown too as this experienced lecturer and showman. I I like the way that he kind of supports William Craft, seemingly coming into his own. As, as a storyteller, but but no, I was so focused on, on the crafts themselves, I don't know that I could really <laughs> pick a, a secondary yeah. character, but I do love a lot of the shorter appearances. In, in yeah, like uh, also, I mean, one thing I, we were talking about sort of how you teach this history, and one of the things I really tried to do was show the intersection between the crafts history converging with the American national narrative as we traditionally sort of get it. So you get Daniel Webster, you get Henry Clay, you get John C. Calhoun, but these guys are the walk-ons, right, instead of the other way around. 
And I really tried to also humanize them because people say, you know, you, you think, oh, Daniel Webster, that's right. He was part of the Compromise of 1850. You think of Henry Clay as like the great compromiser. I mean, I had these sort of little phrases come back from high school. But I mean, who's, who knew that actually uh, that Webster had his own private drinking room in the Capitol. He's the only guy who got to do that. And that uh, Calhoun was actually pretty square, you know, or that, uh, I'll give a little more racy stuff about Daniel Webster. He had this extraordinary miniature of a, it's called the first, the first boob selfie. It's been described in some sort of, there's a miniaturist who painted her body, just one part of it, and in this little painting that you can hold in the palm of your hand so that he could carry it around everywhere. I mean. <laughs> and these are the kind of details that get glossed in high school history classes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and we were, we were <laughs> talking about it uh, before, before we came out. I, one of the things that I appreciate most at, about, your, about your story, about this narrative, is the color and attention that's given to these names that you, pro that you might remember from your high school history class or from a survey course you took at college. Um, and all of this information that just gets completely glossed. And, and I think that you know we all have these uh, deficits in things that we learn. And for me, as hungry as I am for stories like this, there's also just gaps that you have. And every time a really great narrative comes along that gives you a chance to learn, what was it, Daniel Webster, who struggled to sleep after, after uh, passing this compromise, and just those, those kinds of details that, that you may not encounter otherwise, I think, really makes, especially that section of the book, just come alive in a, in a great way as well. I feel like if, if I were a high schooler, that those kind of things would help the history stick a little bit more. Um. Um, so speaking of, of high school and you know the evolution of the story, can you tell us some of the things that may be coming next for, for, for your book and other iterations that it, it may come to, to uh, for, for other readers and other audiences? I, I've been, uh, I mean, I've been really moved by the response to the book and uh, by, by schools now. Um, I'm interested to see how this is going to possibly play out in, in high school, like uh, history classes. And I'm thinking about ways to make the story accessible to even younger readers, um, possibly middle grade, um, early YA. Yeah, I mean, we t have to take out the first boob selfie, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that would be a. Something, something <laughs> <laughs> that one might end up on, on the floor. Um, you know, there was, um, I was thinking about the, the crafts themselves versus uh, the other secondary characters in the story, and my mind just came back to their marriage and the idea of marriage itself in the story. I mean, I think part of the whys of why they were going on this journey was to have a different maybe definition of, of marriage, a more whole definition of marriage. Could you, because this is something that I personally don't know a ton about, maybe the audience in the same boat, can you tell us a bit about what the institution of marriage typically looked like for enslaved people versus what it could be for, for other people and, and that kind of thing? In the well, I mean, the tragedy is there was no legal recognition of marriage for enslaved people. Um, so it wasn't when death do you part or as long as you both shall live or, you know, um, this is why in many cases, like the religious marriage, the Christian marriage was denied. Ellen Craft is denied a Christian marriage because it wasn't, her marriage wasn't going to end when God uh, ended it. It would be when the enslavers ended it. There was absolutely no recognition. And this is something that William writes about really um, painfully. He talks about the bond between his parents, which who were very devout, 
Um, and actually, his first enslaver was also devout uh, in his own way, uh, at least on paper. He's known as a uh, as as a very Christian man, but this Christian man had no qualms about s separating uh, a husband and wife whose bonds were, you know, God. God made, as as uh, as William says, and he calls out that hypocrisy, um, and it's it's one of the, the the major reasons why they decide they they have to run because they want to be together and they want to have children who will not be taken away from them. How the institution of slavery is operating throughout Georgia and throughout the South. Yeah, there's constant episodes and examples of lots of separated families and that being a constant risk. It was not a safe assumption to assume that if you had a child, you would get to raise that child. And, you know. Yeah, and even, I mean, the crafts, they say from the very beginning of their narrative that their situation in slavery was actually better than, than for most people. They had, I mean, they were enslaved in an urban environment. They had skills. They, could, they actually made some money on their own. They had a high degree of independence. They were favored by their enslavers. So I, that's part of the argument, actually, is that if, if even for them it's so bad, right? But they say that, that there are many others for whom things were much worse. And yet, even though they were favored, even though Ellen had the protection of her half-sister, um, biological half-sister as her mistress, the thing is, you never know, right? Somebody dies. Somebody changes their mind. Somebody loses a lot of money. I mean, this is something that William Kraft saw when he was 10 years old. His enslaver was known as this pious Christian man, but the man lost money in the uh, basically cotton gambling. And one of the things that was really just appalling to see in the Macon archives was this document and this beautifully scripted um, hand that lists William, a boy 16 years old, a cabinet maker by trade, and his sister, Eliza, 12 years old, next to, I kid you not, like a, a list of numbered church pews in the Presbyterian church. So these things are up for uh, grabs if this man reneges on his debts, which he did. And when that happens, William and the pews and his sister are all sold together without sort of any... Um, any differentiation between them as property. No, yeah, and it's horrible. It's one of the most heartbreaking parts of their narrative where they just where he describes his last moment of he, seeing his sister. Now, can you hear me? The uh, I'm really surprised I, because I, I I know there's a lot of families that were living on these plantations that had children of, of husband and wife, but they weren't allowed to be a husband and wife. So there were families that were living in these plantations, but they were not recognized as families. And, and they were separated. I, I had no idea that they, they were not recognized, e even though they may not have legally been married. I thought they still looked at them as a family. Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the most shocking documents I came across was uh, it's called the Essay on the Management of Slaves, and it's by Robert Collins, who is Ellen Craft's sister's husband, so her master, her second master. And he writes this, it's basically like, like a kind of how-to for, for owning human property, like how to, like what's the best size uh, for the slave cabins and things like that. And he has sections on like discipline and on, um, things like that. And one thing, he has a whole section on families. And he says, you know, most enslaved people, he calls them slaves, he says most slaves, it doesn't really matter. Like you can separate them, they can start a new family. And he says, but every once in a while there are those who have that kind of bond that makes their masters happy to see. And it's because it's kind of sad to break that apart that it's best not to have people married, uh, enslaved people, slaves marrying outside of a, a, a particular um, ownership. Um, so the word he wouldn't say there is love. Um, and, 
the curious thing actually is that he did give permission because when, when enslaved people wanted to get married, they had to get permission from those who enslaved them. So he did give permission for Ellen and William Craft to be married um, under the best terms possible um, under bondage, uh, even though they were owned by different people. Mm -hmm. You mentioned having to cut some material about their time in Portland. I'm <laughs> curious, uh, was that all contextual background stuff about the people they interacted with, or was there any more detail about their time here in Portland, the crafts, I mean? No, again, there, if the, I wish like Lydia Dennett had kept a diary, wouldn't that be awesome? Actually, it's even possible because when I got to this part of the story, it's when the pandemic happened, so I actually couldn't do archival research. So that would be a great project for somebody to do to see if they might have left some kind of records. Unfortunately, p the people who are doing this kind of dangerous work, uh, both because they were so busy doing the work and because it was so so risky, they didn't often keep records. Um, so I didn't find I, I didn't find anything additional, um, but that's not to say it doesn't exist out there somewhere. I think actually the yeah I mean they did end up earning some money off it, but it's not really a great great way to earn a living. The best way for them to earn a living would have been for them to settle in Boston, use their skills, and in fact at one point pretty early on the 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 travels they announced that William has plans to settle down and start a business, but then the abolitionists are like, oh no, we're gonna find the next leg of this, right? We're gonna, so they vote to have them keep going. So they really do it for the cause. They do it to speak up, um, speak out for all those people, including their loved ones um, who, are, who are left behind in bondage. Yeah, I mean, and there, there was certainly inherited tension there as well, because remember that the mother of her new mistress was this old mistress who just hated the sight of Ellen. But what Ellen Craft is careful to say, what the Crafts are careful to say in their narrative, is that this woman, the new mistress, Mistress Collins, was very different, fortunately, from her mother. And in fact, they never say a negative word about her. They go out of their way to say that she could have done much worse than she did. She could have had Ellen sent to the sugar house for um, brutal physical punishment, which would also have exposed her further to the danger of rape. Um, that was actually one of the clues that later on I was like, a sugar house, but that's in Charleston. So later on, when I realized Ellen had been to Charleston, that sort of clicked into place. Yeah, I mean, they actually didn't have to go very far to figure out where they were, because the, the newspapers were reporting all across the country. I mean, word was just like flashing via telegraph. We didn't talk about the fact that this is a time of like information revolution. So as soon as they're speaking on the road, and their notices of the papers of where they're speaking, I mean, there, this is why it was so risky. Like on top of the fact that, that people are, you know, could throw stones in them and, and all sorts of horrible things that happened to, you know, even white lecturers who didn't have this, their lives on the line, that, you know, the crafts had these unbelievable dangers. But the thing is they get, when they, when, even when they get off the tour, they're in Boston. If you look at the 1850, Boston Directory, which I had the pleasure of doing just a couple of days ago, you can find William Craft right there. You know, he aver he was like, I'm going to live my life and I'm going to do this without fear. Of course, when the time came, um, that put him in, that put the Crafts in even greater danger. It's not reproduced. You can you can actually find it on Hathi Trust or Google Books anywhere online. Oh, yeah, it's easy to find, and they're printed copies as well. Mm -hmm. I should add, though, that one, one of the things that's really interesting is that all the stuff that we're talking about here, the, the, the abolitionist lecture circuit, the, um, none of that is in their original narrative. Uh, so they talk about, really, they focus closely on that escape from Georgia to Philadelphia, but there's not, 
in fact, when this, the whole thing about the slave hunters coming after them, all that, um, they don't write about that at all in their own words. And in fact, William Wells Brown, who we've talked about a number of times here today, his name is not even in the book, too. It's pretty curious. Yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. I didn't, I mean, I didn't really, so my first book is about Eunice Chapman, who fought against her husband and the Shakers and her times for custody of her three children, whom her formerly abusive and alcoholic husband took to the Shakers uh, to live. And she didn't know where they were. And, you know, this is another situation where, I mean, that would have been the end, except she wrote her narrative. She used all of her physical charms, all of her communication skills, her ability to write, to tell her story, to court legislators, and, and she ended up engineering a mob attack, too, to finally bring them home. So the, another, like, you know, story of um, incredible bravery. Uh, and, I'll, and, and I'm thinking actually now about both of them and their storytelling skills. I mean, because without that storytelling, first of all, they wouldn't have accomplished half of the things that they did. Um, and also without that, we wouldn't know their story today. I mean, and I first met them both through the stories that they wrote. I have a very quick question, and, and there seems to be a theme of your writing. Do you have any thoughts for what the next story you're going to tell is? Well, I fully expect it to be onto something by now, but this has been really all-consuming. I mean, I just, uh, my, my publisher was like, just block out January, and then, um, and then you can, you know, keep going on to something else, but this is, the, the story has just opened up in so many different ways, and, and in fact, I feel like it continues to open. Um, just the other week, I was, uh, uh, I, I got to see, I got to go inside the Lewis and Harriet Hayden house, um, which is, yeah, yeah, I mean, I had walked outside of that so many times. This is the house where the crafts were hiding in Boston when there was this, you know, crisis, and I just happened to be there at the right time and got to go in there. So I feel like there's this story is continuing, and in, until this is done, um, uh, I will not be ready to have another one. <laughs> yeah, I think there are film projects in the works. I'm not attached to them, um, but I think this is a story that invites, I mean, it could be a play, it could be a musical, it could definitely cinematic. Uh, when William Wells Brown and the Crafts are in the UK, they speak against this giant panorama, which is actually like the precursor of a, of a movie, like a painting that it's like hundreds of feet long, yeah, it rolls, yeah, and the lights are low, yeah, and they're flashing like parts of it. So, I mean, you could have paintings, all sorts of different incredible artistic uh, evocations of their story. I feel like it invites that. So hopefully this is just the beginning and hopefully I've given, I mean one of the things I really wanted to do is to have super robust footnotes so that the story can keep going and going. My personal vote would be for a 10 episode limited series. <laughs> I do think, I, I, you know, I, I do think that you would need probably like a a bona fide 10 hours to really kind of, you know, capture each of the distinct periods of their, of their escape and to provide all of that beautiful context, like to, to mirror the depth of context that you provide to their journey. I, that's what I have my fingers crossed for. All right, maybe that's coming. And then actually you do get, like William Wells Brown gets his own storyline or his own episode, maybe even Lydia Dennett. Exactly, yeah, you could finally get the, the Portland episode. Yeah. Follow up. Um, you mentioned you had to do a lot of your research about Portland online. I'm curious where you got the address 133 Spring Street for the Dennett. So that was probably at Harvard. So the the Siebert William Siebert has um, has Underground Railroad records. They're extensive. So there's a whole bunch having to do with the Dennett's there. Um, and there was some confusion of their, over their names and all sorts of nerdy stuff and discrepancies between the 1860 narrative and this one. If you're interested in that level of like nerdy detail, it's in the footnotes. <laughs> yeah, well, I looked in the footnotes and I couldn't find something specific about where the Dennett's had lived, so that's why I... I oh, no. Hmm. <laughs> I found the, the newspaper articles that you had cited, but... Okay. 
Okay, well, that was an oversight on my part. But I will say that the, that the Siebert papers at Harvard University at the Houghton Library has them. Mm -hmm. Well, I just, you know, I want to thank you so much for coming to speak with us about this truly incredible book. If you haven't read it yet, I hope you'll, you'll pick one up today. This is a truly essential story that I'm sure many of us are surprised to hear about. A lot of us did not learn about these figures in history. Um, and this just gives us a great opportunity to know more about ourselves and our country and our history. And I think that especially right now, that's an incredibly valuable thing to have. And I want to thank you for being here with us to introduce the story to all of us. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.